you split an atom, man, you've got a bomb, you know, and that's what happens in people's lives is you split truth and you distort it and it's a bomb that goes off in their lives. You know, I think the problem is with, it's the lust for domination. Those who lust for domination, they are dominated by lust, okay? So those who lust for domination, they're actually dominated by lust. When we believe ourselves to be independent, on our own, outside of God and no authority to report to, that's when we become a slave. So when we believe ourselves to be strong in ourselves, we actually are most weak because we're not depending on God. Hey everyone, thanks for joining us on another episode of The Catholic Gentleman. If you are watching us on YouTube, you're going to notice immediately that Sam Guzman is not here. He's on vacation. Let's keep him in our prayers. But we have got a phenomenal guest joining us today, a close friend of both Devin's and myself, Jim O'Day, who is the executive director of Integrity Restored. Jim, how are you doing? Great, guys. I'm so excited to be part of this conversation with you guys. It's just, it's a thrill for me, to be honest with you. Yeah, we are too. I'm looking forward to it. So today, what are we going to talk about? Well, we are actually going to be speaking about a version of masculinity that has taken the world and young men by storm and promises the best way to live your life. While it gets a lot right about our current culture and the crisis that we find ourselves in, what it gets wrong is exponentially more important and eternally more lasting. And we're going to dialogue about that today. If you like what we're talking about, I'd encourage you to head over to Catholic Gentleman Plus, where we're going to go into a more extended edition of this very episode. We do that every week. And in fact, every month we come out with a new session. This month we're talking about sexual integrity and lust inside of Catholic Gentleman Plus. So we're speaking right to the hearts of men and we're speaking language that men can understand and relate to today. It's a great way to support the Catholic Gentleman. So I encourage you to head over there. Mothers, wives, um, women that like listening to the show, we are grateful that you are here. If you're looking for a way to support the Catholic Gentleman, head over to CatholicGentleman.com slash support. We are grateful for anything that you can give us. It helps us go a long way. And if you're not in a position to give us any sort of monetary um, uh, mean or, you know, tie, donation or a thing of that nature, please keep us in your prayers because those are most important. And so, again, thanks for being with us today, Jim. I am looking forward to talking about this very subject matter with you today. It is something that Devin and I have wrestled with back and forth. So, What are we talking about? Well, I'm going to kind of set the stage here for all of our listeners. And what we are talking about is we are talking about a certain individual that has created a huge following and has been in the news quite a bit over the last 18 months. And that individual is Andrew Tate. So for those of our listeners who are not aware, I have prepared just a little brief uh, introduction of who Andrew Tate is. So he's won several kickboxing titles over the last uh, over about 10 years ago. After that, he became the social media influencer and quite a big deal because his influence on TikTok alone had reached over 13 billion views. And so from his kickboxing career and then this social media influencing career, what did he do? But he decided to come out with two businesses. One of them, which was a webcam business, which was designed to basically manipulate women and get them to do whatever he wanted to make a lot of money. And then he created Hustler University, which was designed to help men or to um, help being a choice word here that I didn't think through. But he it was supposed to encourage men to do nothing but... Uh, try and make the most amount of money, teach them how to do that. He had a bunch of millionaires, himself included, on there. And then um, how to uh, change their lives to get the most amount of women and live the most amount of satisfaction. And this platform had over 150,000 men paying forty nine ninety nine a month because they loved what he was preaching. He's been on different uh, podcasts, huge podcasts out there, oftentimes not wearing a shirt because he's an in-shape kickboxer. And so he projects this view of masculinity that's really appealing to hundreds of thousands of men, especially young men who are tricked by this cunning uh, use of words. He is currently now under house arrest because he has been arrested in Romania and he is uh, um, dealing with charges against sexual misconduct and human trafficking and things of that nature. Yet when you listen to him on any show, he's got this cunningness about him, but he also speaks 
part truths. He speaks part truths with such authority that it's often very convincing. And I went down that rabbit hole in preparation for this episode, and I was um, interested, disturbed, and then um, also also fascinated by this case study. So I'm really looking forward to dialoguing about this uh, with you guys. So, Jim, I wanted to get your thoughts right from the beginning here about this Andrew Tate phenomenon, this manosphere, this, uh, you know, the red pill and, and what makes him so appealing. Well, I think, uh, man, there's so many levels that that this disturbs me. And and let me just share th- the biggest level. That was me growing up. I was that guy, right? Uh, grew up, my parents divorced when I was two. Grew up without a dad in my life, really. I would see him once a year uh, for two or three days when he was in town on business. So when I looked around and said, well, what does it mean to be a man while I was growing up in those formative years? I I found a couple things. I found um, media, movie stars, rock stars, um, sports figures. And then I found the wise guys in the neighborhood. Those of you who are from New York are going to know exactly what I mean when I say wise guys. But kind of the criminal element. And I started working in nightclubs at 17 years old as a bouncer and a doorman and worked as a male stripper. And so I went down that path thinking that that was what was going to make me happy. And the thing is, is men, we can chase that falsehood, John. You see what the devil does. The devil is lazy. And Andrew Tate is lazy. He doesn't have to make us go 180 degrees from our true north, from our purpose. Mm. No, just five degrees off center. That's it. And they know that. (laughs) And so that's what really pisses me off so much about (laughs) this, is that these poor men who are feeling, for a lot of reasons, unsuccessful, weak, unfulfilled, for a lot of reasons, and media is a huge problem there, are looking to the wrong things to fill that. I had I had Boss Rutten, you know, Andrew Tate's a great kickboxer. Boss Rutten was one of the best MMA fighters. I had him on my po- podcast some time ago, and we had multiple conversations in preparation for that. And he was the same guy as me, as many men, who thought that if you could fight if you could drink more beer than everybody else, and if you could sleep with more women, that made you a man. And it wasn't until he had a conversion, a conversion of his heart, that now he knows what true manhood is. And I'm going to sum it up in one word, and we're going to talk a lot more about this. If you are not serving with every ounce of your being, you're not a man. Yeah, and I like that a lot. I think that you hit the nail on the head in many different ways, but one of them is is this idea that to work out regularly, to be in great shape, and to then uh, basically be a huckster online and and devote your time to making money and getting women and doing it to a higher degree uh, than most other men makes you somehow... Uh, the guy who's getting it, the guy who's working it, the guy who's putting in the time. But frankly, to live a virtuous life is exponentially harder and more, it takes more dedication across the board. And when you were talking, I just immediately thought of what's happened today uh, to men. And that quote that G.K. Chesterton so prophetically voiced, which was that we have the virtues that have gone mad today because they've been isolated from each other. So Mm -hmm. Andrew Tate has this, this discipline in the, in the gym, right? He probably works out every day. He probably is, stays consistent, wakes up early to get that stuff done. But then it stops there, right? Then there's a real lack of virtues 
everywhere else because they are isolated from each other and they don't work with each other. So, Devin, I'd love to pass it over to you and I'd love to get your thoughts just really here at the beginning about this Andrew Tate phenomenon and what it is that he preaches that brings in hundreds of thousands, if not millions of young men uh, desiring his way of life. Yeah, well, I think basically he preaches discipline strength and independence, right? That's what he says. That's his proclamation. So that's the Andrew Tate gospel. And he preys upon men in this way is that what's, what's the best evangelist? The best evangelist is selling something to someone who doesn't have it. So basically Andrew Tate sells the big three. He sells power, greed, and sex. And he's appealing to a bunch of men who feel like they don't have power or want more power, so they don't have enough of it. They don't have enough sex, and they don't have enough money. And so they sign up with this thinking they're going to get what he has. Now, this is where I think Christianity is really sucking wind right now, and we're on our heels, is because he's doing something that we should be doing. And what I mean by that is like, Look at, look at what's happened over the last 60 years in the church. We hand out salvation like it's Halloween candy. Mm-hmm. It's free. It's easy. It's cheap. You know, and, and so then you get somebody who comes along who has this strength, discipline, all this stuff, independence, and yeah, but you have to work hard for it. Man's life is pain. And if you put in enough pain, you'll have more gain and all that. And it sounds really great. But the truth of the matter is, is that those guys end up, as Jim says, in that, I guess, that quicksand of self-hatred, self-loathing. And mm-hmm. also, they don't really have happiness because what you in, in the secular world, I'm going off here, but in the secular world, in order to have happiness, you have to chain or thread one event of happiness or something that's going to feed you to another and maintain yeah. that. But in Christianity, you don't have to because your happiness, which is the eternal beatitude, is based off of a relationship with Jesus Christ. So it's relationship. It's not based on, I can suffer. I could have terrible events in my life, but if I have Christ, I can suffer manfully and be joyful. So anyway, I think that what's going on here is that Andrew Tate is appealing to the base senses of guys with through discipline, independence, you know, and all that. But here's, is he really strong? I want to put this out to you guys. Is Andrew Tate really strong? Is Andrew Tate really disciplined? Is Andrew Tate really independent? That's a good point. Yeah. Is yeah, he? absolutely. Not at all. No, I no mean, he's the a answer slave. Would, yeah. The answer would be no, uh, you know, Why? in our worldview, certainly uh, would be no. Because here's the thing. If you're working out in the gym like a maniac to the detriment of all the other relationships in your life because you're that self-focused, Are you strong? No, you're weak. You're narcissistic. Now, should we stay in shape? Yeah. yeah. And should we be as healthy as possible because our bodies are the temples of the Holy Spirit? Absolutely. But a guy like Andrew Tate says, well, that's what you need to get the chicks. It's all about purity of intention, guys. Mm. Everything in my life that I've learned in 58 years now, it's about purity of intention. Why am I doing what I'm doing? And if the only reason I'm ever doing it is for my own benefit, that's not strong. That's not virtuous. Yeah. No, so, it's Go for it, Devin. Now I want to yeah. hear this. So I just want to ask each of you, I know I've been on the other side of the fence. You have too, Jim. You were just, t- John, I, I, I know from our conversations you have too. We've all had our past, right? Now, let me ask you this looking at your past before you surrendered your life to Jesus Christ and began living this path, what was your life like? Were you happy? Uh, filled, filled with anxiety. Yeah, it was it, a rudderless, right? It was going all over the place and then uh, worried about everybody's opinion of me and constantly fearful of failing, uh, even in in the uh, a, a test score or a grade or, you know, uh, if anybody, I was a professional trumpet player and I'd be in a practice room and I'm not joking, I was worried about what other people were hearing about how I was practicing and what they were thinking about me, Mm -hmm. right? Because this narcissistic vanity that was just overwhelming within my day um, uh, was at every corner because how people perceived me 
was my status in life. And if people didn't perceive me like I wanted them to perceive me, that would be devastating because that would remove my identity. That would remove, you know, who I had set myself up to be. Jim. So I think probably if you wanted to use a one word descriptor would be hopeless. <laughs> there you go. Because yeah. I could never make enough money. I could never have enough girls. I could never have enough things. Beautiful. Hopeless. Yes. Yeah, that, that, that was my subjective experience too. No matter what my achievements were, no matter, oh, oh and especially if I failed, you know, as St. Monsignor, <laughs> Monsignor Esif would say, he says, self-reliance leads to self-hatred. So when you're, when you're relying on yourself and you do well, you beat your chest and say, look at me, you know, I'm the hero. But when we fail, then we only have ourselves to blame, right? And so we yep. hate ourselves. And most of the time we're gonna come up lacking in the comparison game. But what I hear from both of you guys is this is the key to Christianity and Jesus Christ is freedom. Because Andrew Tate, he says he's independent, but actually he's a slave. He's a slave to his passions and his perversity because he's using people for money. He cannot live in self-gift. He's incapable at this point. He might be capable, but he's seared his conscience so badly. He's, he's bound by selfishness, which means he does not have discipline over himself. He might have discipline over his body in the gym. But he does not have discipline over his emotions, nor his sexual desires or his desire for money. So th yep. in my opinion, what's really going on is, is he's a slave. And Jesus is, this is what's so powerful about Jesus. He, he comes and he says, if you believe in me, he says, I think it's like in John 10, when he's talking Pharisees, you will not, no longer be slaves. And they're like, what? We've been slaves to no one. And he's like, yeah, whoever is, whoever is committing a sin is a slave to it. In a sense, he's talking about Amen. ongoing mortal sin. So what I think the bottom line with Andrew Tate is, is that he, he hijacks. He's very good at hijacking. So if you think about it, the terrorists at 9-11, they hijacked planes, something good, in order to carry out their evil. Biden does it with a rosary. James Martin does it with, you know, church doctrine, right? Uh, so what, what, what we do is we, these people take something that is good and they grab onto it and they use it to crash into buildings and kill million or thousands of people. That's what Andrew Tate is doing. He's taking traditional values. A woman could be at home. A man should work. He should be the protector and the provider. He shouldn't give into world and the world and slavish human opinions, although he does. And, and then those, those traditional values, that seems spot on. But he hijacks that to carry out his misogynistic, misogynistic pornographic business. This is so good. And we've said a lot. And I think that what is very interesting, and I do want people to be aware of this, how this cunningness of Andrew Tate, because it was something that I was incredibly impressed with. I listened to a good portion of his interview with Tucker Carlson and Tucker Carlson. And this is another thing. Tucker Carlson seemed very supportive of Andrew Tate and what was happening to him. Right. In the past. And, and exactly. And so there's this notion that Andrew Tate is uh, delivering a version of masculinity that is so against the feminist movement, therefore he's being canceled and silenced for it. And isn't that what Satan wants us to see too? It's like, ah, Andrew Tate is, you know, he is just being a man's man. And because such, you know, this world that's controlled, right? They talk about the matrix, they talk about the red pill and everything like that. This I world gotta jump being, in. Please. I, I, <laughs> yeah. I mean, if, if Andrew Tate and I were in the same room, he would kick my ass. I get it. No problem. But I would say to his face, you are not a man's man, because if you were a man's man, you would be protecting those women. There you go. How can you abuse a woman and call yourself a man? No way. Yeah, I'm that's sorry. What and it's so interesting because on the Tucker Carlson interview, he actually brought that up. But what he said was, and this is, again, the, the, the Satan and how what he said was, you want to see a dangerous man. You talk about a man who has lost his emotions and lost control over his emotions. And he said, that's a dangerous man. He goes, what men should be doing is providing for and protecting for women. He actually said that. And I'm like, ah, oh, then do it. But wait a minute. <laughs> exactly. But that's just it. Because when you speak these partial truths or you speak these broad generalizations and you speak it with such authority or conviction that he does, you convince millions of young men that frankly 
look at this, the world and they don't know whether they should open a car door for a woman or not because they're worried that they're going to get chastised. And so then you get somebody like Andrew Tate who comes along and says, no, you do it because it's the right thing to do as a man. And they're like, yeah. Oh, and by the way, he says, you should be able to, you know, work, work out, make a lot of money and get as many of these women in bed as you want. And it's like, and they're like, that sounds great too, right? Because it's appealing to such, such base level, um, uh, concupiscence, right? It's, it's, it's appealing to our vices and our concupiscence as men. And I think that, um, Mm -hmm. that it is. And I, I just, I, I want to go back to that cunningness. So, so if you happen to fall in, you're listening to this right now and you happen to fall in, you happen to listen to, to Andrew Tate. It's very interesting to note the truths that he speaks, but then the way that he coerces them and he manipulates them to um and then frankly how he lives his life so contrary even to the the uh portions Things of truth he that he's speaking right. exactly Absolutely. Devin well, looked like you're gonna say yeah, something well, yeah this is this is the age old tactic of the devil is to take a truth and warp it that's what Satan yes. did in the desert with Jesus using scripture you know you know he and he did it in the garden with Adam, you know, in Eve, he uses a truth, you will not die. Okay, well, yeah, maybe not in the moment that I eat it, right? My soul might, but the point is, is he takes a truth and he splits it. And it, and, and that's what's the Adam, you split an Adam, man, you've got a bomb, you know? And that's what happens in people's lives is you split truth and you distort it and it's a bomb that goes off in their lives. You know, I think the problem is with, it's the lust for domination. Those who lust for domination they are dominated by lust, okay? So those who lust for domination, they're actually dominated by lust. When we believe ourselves to be independent on our own, outside of God and no authority to report to, that's when we become a slave. So when we believe ourselves to be strong in ourselves, we actually are most weak because we're not depending on God. Amen. Oof. So good. I am grateful for that, Devin. I actually do want to take a step here and I want to talk a little bit about this archetype that he is bringing up. And I realize I just moved away from the mic and back. So I apologize <laughs> for listening in. It's like, what happened to John? Um, and so th- we talked about this in the past. We talked about this on one of our episodes um, last year uh, where we discussed an archetype of man is to be the warrior, is to be the fighter. Is to be the protector. And I think that when I was think, prepping for this show, I did discern that with Andrew is that with his modern kickboxing and um, uh, he's he's presented an archetype or an arch you know, that that speaks to the hearts and minds of men. And so they're appealing of that because we do want to be in control. We want to possess our body in such a way that we feel like it will do for us what we need it to do when the time is right or the time, you know, comes upon us or just throughout our day-to-day life. We all know that it feels better when we've worked out regularly and we're consistent with that um, when we're in shape. But there's also this aspect of the warrior or the fighter, and that's the ability to, to protect yourself or protect protect others, right? And so I say he presents that in such a way. However, if left unhinged or left without the primary goal of Christ, right, which is that emptying of ourselves, that kenosis, so that we might be filled with God to become a true man, we're left with being a come, becoming a, um, a masochist, a sadist, a dictator within all of those different things. Yep. So, Jim, I'd love to hear you talk a little bit about this archetype, since I know you're uh, a professional fighter as well, or have had a past in professional fighting, <laughs> and, yeah. uh, and, uh, and kind of get your thoughts about this archetype because i do think that addressing that is important for the minds of young men uh as they see something in him that they wish they themselves had when it comes to this so i i want to talk about it in terms of a concept and this is a this is a concept that that uh devin and i uh went through a weekend together with a couple other guys and that's called a sheepdog Many of your listeners, if they're in military or law enforcement, they'll understand the term sheepdog. But what there are in the world is most of the people, including the men who are drawn to Andrew Tate, most of the people in the world are sheep. 
they don't feel strong. They don't feel equipped. They kind of go around the, their life with their head in the sand, just hoping something bad doesn't happen. Then you have another percentage of people that are the wolves. And those wolves, like Andrew Tate, are willing to prey on the sheep because it benefits them. And then there's a very, very small group. And this is what I believe every single Catholic man in the world is called to be. And that is a sheepdog. Who are the men willing to put themselves between the wolf and the sheep, regardless of the cost? And that cost may be people say you're weird. Why do you pray like that for your family? People may see you're old fashioned. Why don't you watch pornography? Everybody does it. People may say you're out of touch with the times. Women don't need to be treated like that anymore. But we are called to be sheepdogs. We are called to care for those who are being preyed on. And that's what I think is missing for young men today. And that's the call they need to hear because that's in us. God built that into our very souls as men. Don't let the warped version turn you into a wolf. Be the sheep dog. Yeah. Amen. No, I very much appreciate that. Uh, Devin, thoughts on this archetype? Thoughts on this? Uh, who are we protecting? Why are we working on ourselves to be warriors and fighters? So therefore we can... Uh, help the vulnerable and help those that are in need. I'd love to hear your thoughts. Yeah. Well, what I think is really remarkable about you, Jim, is that you are a fighter, you are a warrior. And then what you have done is you've taken all that, you know, that passion and that true grit, that true physical power, all of that. And now you are fighting a real battle. That, and in fact, you are actually on the opposite side of the battle as Andrew Tate, because you're fighting pornography. You're fighting the exploitation of the human being. And I, I think John Paul II said this in, uh, in his Theology Body documents. He says that the human being is the kind of being that does not admit of being used. And what he's saying is, is that mm -hmm. in our deep subjective level, no human being enjoys being used and manipulated and coerced and abused. abused. But, here's, but the malice person or the malicious one he enjoys it at the expense of the other. But the moment that it turns and it comes back on him where he's being abused, he's being used, he's taken advantage of, then it's no more fun. The game isn't fun anymore. And so th this is the tragedy of those who are malicious in intent is that they're preying upon the sheep. And as long as that's going well, they're going to continue to do it. Mm -hmm. You've stepped into the breach, Jim, because you're going against you're actually now a true warrior in the truest sense. You've taken all that warrior spirit that you have and you're applying it to defense of God's children. And that's what you're right. That's what we need more of. So I don't I didn't. John, you asked two questions at the end of that. I, I don't I didn't get to those, but I just wanted to comment on. I, I see in Jim Thank a you, true brother. archetype now yeah. of of a modern warrior, what that really looks like. And Jim, for our listeners, why don't you share with them a little bit about your past and, um, and your expertise in the martial arts space? Sure. So uh, it's been uh, 35 years now. I've been a, a student of and teacher of the martial arts and um, started out uh, really in a very traditional uh, judo first and then uh, Japanese karate and Japanese jujitsu, <laughs> Japanese weapons. And over to studied a little bit of American Kempo over time, kind of, um, you know, now that I've gotten older, I, I want to kind of take all the best of what the traditional martial arts has to offer uh, in the in the traditions. Right. We have something to learn from respect and honor and integrity. But but when I teach like uh, Devin and I did a few uh, sessions together. Um, I really break all that stuff out and and just what works the best on the street. So if you're walking into a restaurant with your wife, you're scanning. Where's the exit? What's the vibe? If the back of the hair on the back of your neck starts to tingle, you turn around and walk out. You start to pay attention to that stuff because the best self-defense we could ever teach anybody is awareness.
Most of us are clueless today. Yeah. We got our earbuds in, we got our faces in <laughs> right. our phones, so blah, blah, blah. Right. So just, that's, that's always, sorry, John, that's always been a no, passion please. of mine. Um, and, and how did it become a passion? I was 21 years old when my birthday present was, honey, I'm pregnant. And praise be to God, 37 years later, Kim and I are still, ma- still married. Two beautiful praise kids. Amen. Uh, two amazing grandkids. And so, but Kim, being the smart woman, said, uh, you know, you're not working in the nightclubs anymore. You're not going to the bars and shooting darts and doing all that stuff. So I needed to find something for me. And for me, that was the martial arts. And even all the guys I work with in recovery from pornography addiction, John, I tell them, get into the martial arts. It's going to help you. Yeah, no, I believe it. Have that level of of discipline and, and control. And so when Kim said you're not allowed into the clubs anymore, you said that's a good thing because I'm not allowed in, in anyways because my hands are weapons. And uh, <laughs> so they, they, they can't get me, can't get past the door anyway. So no, thank you, Jim. I appreciate you um, putting up with my dumb jokes and sharing that. Um, <laughs> um, but I think I, again, now going back to, to this, uh, this conversation of what it means to be uh, a real man is is that man who's seeking uh, the virtue for the sake of others. It's the man who is, who's seeking the virtue of a, um, of the ability to have fortitude, to, the ability to have courage, to have these perseverance, these virtues, resiliency, et cetera, for the sake of others, not for yep. the sake of himself and for the betterment of himself. And I think that that's what we see and what we hope men listening to this episode are getting out of this is that at the end of the day, Andrew Tate and his ilk are going to come along and they're going to say, well, the whole society is stacked against you. Screw it. You need to do what's best for yourself. And sure, these lofty ideas that the Catholic gentlemen are presenting uh, to you are uh, might sound good, but they're unachievable anyways. And again, you're fighting an impossible battle because this has gone on for generations and generations and generations. And therefore, get ahead for yourself because that is how you are going to find a life worth living. And we are here to state just because it's hard, just because it's more difficult, don't give up. Because that's what Andrew Tate is doing. And that's what his ilk is presenting, is this idea that things are difficult, things are hard, things are stacked against you. The culture is uh, a mess. And so therefore, just give up and look out for number one. So Devin, I love your thoughts. I love it. And it just, everything you're saying just reminds me of the seen in the Passion movie where Satan is saying to Jesus as he's agonizing, no one can do this. No one, never, no one. All the, all the doubt words, the N words, right? And, Mm -hmm. and, and that's, that's the culture. The culture is going to tell you that. But, and, but I love Christ is the ultimate man. Here it is. Salvation for every human being is literally on the line. The eternal destiny of every human soul is determined on what he will do in that moment. Is he going to flee? Is he going to protect himself, CYA? What's he going to do? And it says, I love the scripture. It says that he simply went forward. That, that's the key. In the Christian life, all you have to do is take the next step forward. God will aid you with grace. God will supply the power that you need. But here's the deal. The worldly guy says, no, I need to appeal to my base desires and that'll be just fine because that'll propel me. It is so much more difficult to step forward, but Christ will empower us to do so. And that's when we become the real man. Christ, I love it. In the agony in the garden, he had, he knew the choice. The choice was total expenditure of self for the sake of those who he was responsible for or just CYA. And he does it. And that's what I want to be like. That's the real man. I lived my life where I was always covering my own ass. You know, I was always all about myself. And I was always trying to seek the gain. But it was amazing. There was a point, I can't remember, it was was after I surrendered my life to Christ, suddenly there was just like, or gradually there was this idea, oh wait, I can do this without expecting anything back. 
And it, it, I felt so alive. And it was weird. I was like, wait a minute. I just gave away my money, and yet I feel full. I feel satisfied. Wow. Oh, wait a minute. I actually just love my wife and not trying to get intercourse or sex from her. I feel alive. Like, it was so bizarre. Yeah. Like, I actually met with someone, listened to their problems the whole time, and didn't bring up my own problems, and I felt alive. And I was like, what's going on? It's because that's the way we're supposed to feel, because you give, you live. You use, you lose. And this is where Andrew Tate is at right now. He's, he's incarcerated. We're almost and a you know home incarceration and he's being shipped off to britain to be tried there but mm-hmm. this is the key when you live for yourself jesus says this in john 12 i believe it's 24 i think unless a grain of wheat falls to the ground and dies it remains alone and this is the key Christ is giving us the recipe to not be in isolation, which is hell, but to live in communion with others and have joy to the full. And how is that? By giving yourself away. Because when you do so, like Christ, you become a magnet of self-giving love and people want to be around you. People desire to have what you have, not just because you can teach them how to get more sex and get more money and get more power, but because you can become who you really are and become alive. Yeah. We are, we are destined to live in contradiction to the world, not just be a different image of, of the world, uh, to people. And right. in, in, in doing such, um, we just, mm, there's so much that you stated. We just, we, ha- yeah, we have to constantly come back to these teachings and constantly come back to these truths because it's so easy to get washed in well, to, uh, the noise of the world. Yeah, Jim. As men. This really struck me when Devin was talking. As men, do we really know the real Christ, the real Jesus, or the kind of feminized version with the golden halo? If you want to talk about a tough man, think of Jesus. Yes, he was kind. Yes, he was giving. But he lived a very tough life. And with a couple of ropes, he cleared out a marketplace. Like, he was strong. He was tough. People weren't messing with him. And then the ultimate toughness. Yeah. He gave himself away completely bodily, spiritually, and emotionally. That's a tough guy, ladies and gentlemen. I mean, he was, he was so tough that as they're driving nails through his hands and his feet, literally, he is forgiving them. Amen. That, that, that is, I, I don't know any man who can do that outside the grace of God. That's incredible. Amen. So yeah. here's, here's a question I want to throw out. So, Jim, because, you know, you run Integrity Restored, you coach men and women all the time uh, in he- drawing them out, exodus from their pornographic addictions and sexual addictions. So let's just say, this way of life that Andrew Tate is proposing, does it rewire the brain? And, and if it does, what are the behavioral effects of that? Because I think that determines the trajectory right there. It's like, does it rewire the brain? And if it does, what are the behavioral effects? Is it all right if we go down this road? Uh, John, what do you think? Yeah, yeah absolutely. Let's go down this road. I, I mean, I want to talk about I also want to spend time and make sure we discuss what happens to the 98% of men that are in Hustler University that are incapable of uh, even trying after striving to to become like Andrew Tate because they just don't have the grit to use other people as much as he does. And uh, and so they grit's not the right word. It's the word that came to my mind. But I, I want to make sure that we also spend time talking about that. But yeah, let's talk about this. How does it rewire the brain, Jim? Like, um, does it rewire the brain? First question. And then if so, how? Like, why can't we just seek after our own self gratifications, pleasures done. So in the guys that this is what it means to be a real man. And the more women that we are with, the more manly we are. You know, it's really incredible because God's design, um, when, when you bring the science, uh, into it, into the addiction of pornography or sex addiction or whatever, it's, it's amazing how the science a hundred percent matches up with the Catholic moral teaching. Yes. A hundred percent. There is no deviation. People don't want to talk about that because that means no. It doesn't mean no. It means yes to the bigger yes. 
And go. so what we're missing is the real understanding of who we are. So the way our brains work when we are sexually aroused, well, let's just talk about orgasm for a second. Mm-hmm. There's two types of orgasm, resolved and unresolved. An unresolved orgasm is when you are by yourself watching pornography, you go up the hill, you have a little plateau, you peak, climax, and then you crash. And all those wonderful chemicals that God created, dopamine, Delta Fos B, oxytocin, all the different endorphins, man, they plummet and you feel terrible. You feel unsatisfied, which is why you have to do it again. When you're in a loving, monogamous, two key words, loving, monogamous relationship, and you have sexual intercourse with your wife or your husband, it's the same climb. It can look exactly the same, the arousal. The orgasm can feel exactly the same, but what's different is afterwards. It's a very gentle slope down where the chemicals in your brain slowly diffuse as opposed to crashing because God knows what he's doing. What does that do? That keeps those two spouses bound together. And, and when, when the Catholic Church says that, you know, the closest we can get um, to experiencing the love of the Trinity is during sexual union with our spouse, that's true. It's self-giving. The Father gives to the Son, the Son to the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit to the Father. And it's this constant giving. Well, that's what sex is supposed to be, ladies and gentlemen. But what Andrew Tate teaches is no, it's about taking. Sex is not about giving, it's about taking. What do I get? I deserve it. Give it to me. And so that's how your brain rewires, where everybody you meet in every situation, not just sexual situations, it's about what does that do for me? Mm-hmm. It becomes a very selfish, narcissistic way to live our lives. Yeah. And so in living like that and doing that consistently and consistently and consistently, what are some of the fallout? What are some of the uh, the um, addictive tendencies, addictions, et cetera, that uh, we condition or men condition themselves uh, to do? And, and I want to pause here because we've got three men on the show that are here to tell you that the opposition to Andrew Tate's view is the marriage sacrament, is to live a holy, virtuous life, to work with your wife, to have a family, and to build that family that lives in opposition to the world, because that's the only way that this world is going to change. Not this conversation right here, not this podcast. Our, our influence is, is not going to change the world, but men living their lives as real men, uh, um, committed to the marriage sacrament, committed to their wives and their children, choosing to make money so that they can better support and that they can better live out their vocation in accordance with God's will. That's what's going to change society for the good, not this hedonistic, narcissistic uh, viewpoint. So, sorry, I went on a tangent there, but coming back, <laughs> what happens when we've fallen into these addictions? Um, so, Well, one of, the, one of the things that happens, I mean, you know, the American Association of Matrimonial Lawyers, a uh, fancy name for divorce attorneys, right? Yeah. <laughs> uh, they have said that, that in, in up to 60% of divorces, pornography plays a role, right? Why would that be? Well, because now we are strictly in a consumable relationship. Yeah. What can I get out of it? And so one of the things that that creates in us is this constant unhappiness. And, and why would I say that? Well, because... Just like with drugs or alcohol, we build up a tolerance. We build up a tolerance for everything. And so there's never enough. You're always looking for the next high, the next dopamine rush, the next good feeling for you. And that's impossible. You know, I tell my guys that I'm coaching all the time, sometimes we just have to embrace the suck. Yeah. It's just not going to feel good, but we got to do it anyway. Yeah. Yeah. 
That's right. And then when you come out on the other side, man, it's you feel great. The difference between happiness and joy. Happiness is momentary. Joy is forever. And so what we should be fighting for with all of our being against our base nature is pursuit of joy. Yeah. Excellent. Devin, I want to hear um, we're coming to the end of the public edition of this episode. So, Devin, I want I want to hear from you um, about what it is in relationship to this Andrew Tate phenomenon that has uh, truly, and if people don't know, he was the third most Googled person in the world for a period of time. That's huge. And so this is a big deal, and this is exactly what we are called to fight against. So, Devin, I'd like to hear your thoughts on what it is that we are presenting in opposition to this view and the depth that it provides for men. Gosh, what are we presenting? Uh, you guys have both said it. You've, you've expressed yeah. it over and over. It, it is the true man is the man who lives in self-giving love. He is capable of sacrifice. We don't respect the 40-year-old the son who's living in his parents' basement playing video games because he thinks he's going to be a professional video gamer and he's just sponging off of his parents. We respect the guys that stormed Normandy Beach and actually helped win World War II and gaining humanity's freedom from the clutches of Hitler. You know, Amen. We, we respect people like Maximilian Kolbe who says, don't take this dad here let him go and take me instead. And he puts the fear of God into that Nazi you know, general or whoever it was because he's never seen anyone brave enough to do that. That's the kind of man that we're called to be. We're called to be the guy who's willing to sacrifice his life for the sake of others. And it begins, the testing ground is in your personal relationships at home. Because if you don't Absolutely. get it right at home, don't do it, don't, don't profess it or even try it abroad. You know, like the... the so I, I say this a lot, but I'm a broken record, but don't think about leading a Bible study at your church if you're not leading at home, you know? Don't think Amen. about leading pilgrimages if you're not taking your family to church on Sunday or maybe even a daily mass once in a while. You know, personal transformation. And, and see, this is what Andrew Tate is proposing is personal transformation. Get a better body, master your finances, you know, get power and domination and you'll be respected, blah, blah, blah. But the point is, it's all at the service of you being the king and everybody else's subject. The key here is this, though, is that God's calling us to be the man who can say, now, you know what? I'm going to step in and my personal transformation, whether it's to have physical fitness, to have my finances under control, maybe a little bit of the bank, yeah. but I'm able to use it for the sake of others. So my personal transformation leads to relational transformation. It's just like the, the Jordan River. It flows into the Dead Sea and it flows into the Sea of Galilee. But why is the Dead Sea dead? And why is the Sea of Galilee teeming with life? Because the Sea of Galilee has an inlet and an outlet for the Jordan River. So it circulates. So you gain, yeah. you receive, and then you give. The Dead Sea is dead because it only receives. And yep. that's precisely what's happening to Andrew Tate and all of his lackeys is and they're paying his, $50 yes. a month and eventually they end up dead and there's no life in their sea. So what we that's have right. to do as men is we receive all the greatness that God wants to give us. Psalm 8 says this, oh God, who, what is man that you make him in your image and likeness that you place all things under his feet? You give him power and glory and honor, et cetera, et cetera. Yet God says, now I want you to give from that surplus back. That's the sacrifice. That's the real man. And so we team with life when we do that. That's a difference between a Catholic man and a hustler man is he's just a dead sea because he's only taking and never really actually giving where it hurts from himself mm -hmm. on Normandy Beach. Mm -hmm. Here's the amazing thing, though, guys. God can change his heart yeah. in an instant. Yeah. yeah. And those we hope he will. Millions and millions. Of, we pray for that. We should all. Yeah. Whoever's listening, pray for this guy. Because mm -hmm. what he's been able to do with a warped vision if he truly knew God's vision for him as a beloved son, and he used the airwaves to spread that message, amazing what could happen. So let's trust in God that he has Andrew Tate's best interest at heart too. We know that. Well, he does. And he wants he, to reach him and touch him. 
Well, he does, and he's he he had Lucifer's best interest in mind too. You know, I mean, yeah. He, yeah. He, that's that's our God. Our God gives the power. He gives the glory, and we have the choice of whether it, it, it's yes. back to the it's back to the old. Am I am I going to be the moon who reflects the light of the sun into darkness, or am I going to be what's about ready to happen? Am I going to get in the middle of that sun and just eclipse the world because I just want it yep. all for myself? I want all the glory myself. Exactly. Exactly. And this is what it means to be storing up treasures in heaven, not here on earth. And this is exactly what uh, Andrew Tate is not teaching, is rather to store up treasures here on earth. And I'm going to finish it with one last thought uh, that Devin just brought to mind here is the fact that we're not statistics. We are we are individuals with human dignity, loved by the infinite creator who um, came and became man suffered and died for our sins so that we might have the opportunity for eternal salvation and reward and bliss in heaven. And that is what we are called to make the choices in our lives. And there's that word choices every day to pursue and to live and in this kenosis, right? This emptying of ourselves that we might become the man that God has created us to be. And I can guarantee you that the man that God has created you to be is exponentially greater and better and more fulfilled than the man that Andrew Tate is, or he's uh, presenting that you could become through that method. yeah. Yes, please. We, I, I just let's. I just invite all men to be very real with themselves and to do some self analysis and say, okay, if I'm living that way, if I'm addicted to porn, or if I'm trying to hustle women, or if I'm living for money and money is my god, I just, I just challenge you to really do some self analysis and ask yourself, am I happy? Am I really satisfied? Do I feel like I'm actually becoming the person that I'm called to be? None of us, us three, we were there. No, we know we've been on both yeah, sides. Of the fence. And I, and I right. can tell you being on the Christ side of the fence, it is so fulfilling. Even though you have bad days, even though you have a hell of a lot of suffering, it's incredibly fulfilling. Incredible. And I do, you know, Karl Marx said that Christianity is the opiate yeah. of the masses, right? Yeah. Well, guess what? I do believe it's the opiate of the masses. You know why? Because it's a pain pleasure principle. Because when you are striving yeah, for holiness, yeah. when you're striving for heaven, that dopamine is released in your brain. You keep going, and that's the opiate that we're all living on. Whereas the world, the opiate that they're living on is that pleasurable hit of pornography or whatever, and then they they crash. We're just mm-hmm. like shh. We're escalating. Amen. Amen, brother. Yeah. I think it's so great. So to end this public episode here, if you like what we are talking about, head over to Catholic Gentleman Plus. We are going to be going through an extended edition. Today, we're actually going to be talking more about this uh, pornography addiction, what men can be doing to overcome it, and what men can be doing to standing into the breach to be sheepdogs in this situation over there at Catholic Gentleman Plus. But before we get there, we want to end this public episode with a putting on the new man. And Jim, you already called men uh, to, uh, to, uh, uh, a prayer for uh, for Andrew Tate, but I want to hear, do you have any other suggestions, any other calls to men that they could achieve within the next seven days, challenge men within the next seven days to do something, not only to be either, either better their lives or better others, which will better their lives mm-hmm. in this putting on the new man segment here. Yeah, so the, the first thing is, is going back to exactly what Devin said. Today, right now, tonight, whenever you have an opportunity, Really look at yourself. We hate to do it as men. We like to wear a mask that we show to everybody else and we make believe like that's who we really are. No, stand in front of the mirror. Who really are you? And you're going to find out you're not happy. That's the things you're chasing after. And I want to I want to piggyback on that. And when you get to that point, if you've really done your analysis, That's when we want you to surrender it all to Jesus. Mm -hmm. Lord Jesus, I surrender this pathetic life that I've ran into the ditch. I surrender to you. You take over. You drive. You drive. Lord, I surrender it to you. 
I think that's the key to this. It's like, yeah, we can go down, we can do the self-analysis, we can feel terrible about ourselves, and then we'll go get a quick fix to try to, you know, get a dopamine hit to try to relieve ourselves. No, surrender to Jesus and let him Amen. into the pain and the depths of your heart, and then let him work from ground level, ground, you know, zero, and let him build you up. Amen. <clears throat> Uh, then my next challenge, John, so it's going to be a total of three. Number one, right. really look at yourself. Number two, every morning, the first 10 or 15 minutes ain't about you. You don't get to drink your coffee. You, yes, you could get up and go to the bathroom, but then open up your Bible. The first 10 or 15 minutes are about God. Yeah. Because that's who we're meant to be, the son serving the father. We can't do that if we don't have conversation with them. And once the phone and the day and the <clears> wife <throat> and the kids and everything gets in the way, forget it. Our minds can't hear. So the first 10 or 15 minutes in quiet, read some scripture. Go to Integrity Restored. Look at some of our old podcasts. We did one on Lexio Divina, how to pray that way. It's really cool. Uh, Wonderful. The third thing is... Who are you serving today? And that's your question every day. Because you're either serving God or you're serving Satan. It's that simple. And the way you can serve God, it's simple. Love your wife. Love your wife. Serve your wife. Love your children. Serve your children. Love your friends. Serve your friends. This is simple stuff. God doesn't expect us to go out like John the Baptist and wear sackcloth. If you're called to that, go right ahead. But I think he really just wants us to serve those in our inner circle. Who did God put there? He put them there for a reason. How are you going to serve them today? Yeah. Amen. Jim, what a blessing having you on the show. It's been a great conversation. Where can men go to find your work and to help spread the, the good news of Integrity Restored? So the easiest thing to do is go to integrityrestored.com. Uh, we have a number of different things. We have a, a podcast every week that both of you gentlemen, I've had the honor of having you on the show. Um, we have an online coaching program, uh, which is 26 sessions. Each session has 15 minutes of a teaching, 15 minutes of a Q&A, and then a, a quick little uh, three to five question assessment. And so... Uh, we have a program for wives suffering from betrayal trauma called Bloom for Catholic Women. We have free ebooks. Go to the website. There's a lot of resources. And, and if we can help in any way, reach out. Send us a note. We're here to help you. Praise God. Well, thank you, man. Thank you, listeners, for joining us on this episode of The Catholic Gentleman. And as we end each of our episodes, be a man, be a saint. <laughs>